When I was reading Fever, I came across the fact that Benjamin Franklin had been a slave owner. And I didn't know that. Nobody taught me that. They always talked about his servants in his books. And when I first read it, I was like, no, you're making that up. So I did, you know, went to the bi footnotes, bibliography's primary source, and I discovered that he owned slaves from 1735 to 1781. And we have primary source evidence that he owned at least seven people, in addition to which he made money off of runaway ads and facilitating as a printer and kind of a central gathering place the return of runaway slaves to their owners. And this slayed me. It just... <laughs> my hero, there's this big crash as my hero falls off his pedestals. And I was so confused, you know, because I think like a lot of Americans, particularly white Americans, I had swallowed that cup of selective amnesia that allows us to say, well, yeah, Washington and Jefferson were slave owners, but, and, and not focus in on the ugly truth. So I filed that fact away and worked on a couple of other books. And as I was researching independent dames, women in American history, in American Revolution, I came across more evidence of slaveholding in the North. And I was like, I don't understand this. I, nobody taught me this. I don't get it. I have to read about it. So I did a lot of researching into slavery in the North, which was insidious and widespread. In 1776, one in five people in New York City was a slave. 20% of the population. Abigail Adams's father, the Reverend William Smith, was a slave owner in Boston. He owned Phoebe and Tom. Um, Abigail's husband, John, and their son, John Quincy, were the only two of our first 12 presidents who didn't own slaves. And so uh, the, these facts are accumulated. There's a whole lot more that I could go on about for several hours. Read my book. They're in there. Um, but these facts accumulated. And for, I, for a long time, I didn't know if I could write the book. Um, I'm thinking about what would it be like to be a slave when everybody around you is talking about liberty and freedom. But as an American, I was so upset and devastated and confused by this that I was um, kind of, you know, lost, very lost. Um, but it was, you know, I, I kept on focusing in on, on the character. I went to an exhibit at the New York Historical Society. It was, called, it was a wonderful exhibit called Slavery in New York. And there was a sculpture of a man and a woman, um, African American, trying to run away at the beginning of the exhibit. And it was made of very thin wire. And it's just their outlines, very detailed. Um, and I stopped dead when I saw that sculpture because it was ghostly. And I realized that I had ghosts at so many levels in my head at this point, um, and that many white people in all the colonies um, did not see. Uh, black people as fellow Americans. They were ghosts. They were, they were property. They were real estate. And I heard my character's voice in my head for the first time standing in front of that wire sculpture. And she said, the best time to talk to ghosts is just before the sun comes up. I wrote it down in my little notebook and I was off. Off to the races. Um, you know, I discovered all this stuff I didn't know about New York City in 1776 and, and sort of where, where people's thinking was. Um, by the end of the book, I had come through a transformation uh, as an American. Because while it was the aristocracy, many of them slave owners who led the war effort and the movement to freedom, and a very brilliant man uh, who I honor and have a lot of respect for those decisions. But it, they didn't win the war. It was ordinary people, poor people, desperately poor people, and slaves, and women, who struggled and sacrificed for years and years to break free of England. And when I really had a better understanding of the work of the ordinary people, um, including slaves, there were 5,000 African American men, free and enslaved, who fought for the Patriot side. And what united all of these people, why are they fighting for this cause led by the American aristocracy? They're fighting because they believed in the language of the Declaration of Independence, that all men are created equal and that are united by these common liberty, you know, liberties and these, these God-given things. And folks believed that language. It was so powerful. And, and so when I got to the end of the book, I was like, you know, I can still love Ben Franklin and Washington and Jefferson. At the same time, feeling very sad that they blew it when it came time to write the Constitution. Um, because they put the elephant in our living room that we're still struggling with. 
Our sin of racism in America today is a direct result of A, their actions, and B, our misunderstandings about slavery. So for me, the American Revolution is not quite over yet. Um, we still have, I, and I kind of took on a new mantle for myself um, personally, um, and, and, and Isabel has helped me with all this, like my character is so alive. Because um, she has to choose, she has to make her own freedom, because no one's going to give it to her. And I kind of see that that's all of our responsibility if we're ever going to be, if we're ever going to fulfill the dream of our revolution, is to realize that we all have to make our own freedom and make it for each other. And I'm very happy to report that we are now, at this point, closer than I've ever seen in my lifetime to fulfilling that dream. And maybe our revolution is about to be over. We'll see.